Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the community members of Kudji and the surrounds. My name is Raj Sunrai and together with my host, Julie Owens, we will be taking you on this a presentation of fire safety essentials. Right from the onset, I would just like to say that there is no need for you to take notes of this presentation. All the information that we are going to talk about will be available by way of a download. And we'll talk about that very shortly at the end of the presentation. I thank you for joining us this afternoon. The duration of this presentation is about an hour to an hour and a half. It is reliant on engagement from yourselves and we'll talk more about the way that we do that. As is traditional in this situation, I would first of all like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are hosting this online meeting today. And, with, and also pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and of course, any other Aboriginal people that are here and watching this presentation today. In the next slide, I would like to hand over to Julie and ask her to give us an introduction to the technology that we're actually gonna be using today to make this engagement process work effectively for us all. Julie? Thanks, Raj. Yes, we are on a webinar. We're using the webinar format, which means that we can't see you, you are only able to interact with us through the chat function and by answering polls um, when we put them up on the screen. We will be showing um, animations and short videos during the session. And I'll, I must um, let you know that this is being recorded, but it's only being recorded for Raj and my benefit. Anything that you um, put in your chat or polls will not be recorded. It's just for us, um, for our learning. To see, what, um, to see what we can do better. Our aim is to empower you with fire safety essentials and to keep you safe during times of fire. So what we might do is have a practice of the chat function at present right now. So if you open the chat box, you will see that um, by doing that, there's a little icon down the bottom of your screen or it might be at the top. And when you press that, a box comes up it says to all panellists and attendees. So just make sure that you've got that. Drop down the arrow if it doesn't then say that. And then write something, you type something in the message there. So perhaps um, you could type, give us an idea of where you're from. Whereabouts in Kaji and the surrounds do you come from? What part do you come from? So during the presentation, we'll be using that chat function and Raj and I will be monitoring it. So anytime that you would like to ask a question, or make a comment, use the chat function. Um, we're also using polls. So the polls will be put up. Um, we will let you know when we're going to put up the polls. They are anonymous, optional, and you have to scroll through the responses. You click on the response, then you'll have to click submit to submit your polls. When the polling is finished, um, I will then open the shared poll responses and you'll be able to um to see what people have put in once again though won't be recorded and we won't know who's voting or who's clicking on what it'll all be anonymous so some of the polls we'll just ask you to um have a guess at things you may not know the answer that's what we're here for to talk you through those things but so don't forget to use the chat function during the presentation if you have a comment and, um, and then participate in the polls when we put them up. And it's good to see that some people are coming through with the chat to see that um, they live just out of Kaji and they do live around Kaji. Um, some live in the township of Kaji. Thanks, Raj. Fantastic. Actually, Julie, it might be a good idea just to launch that first poll to give people an idea of how it yeah. actually works. Actually, that's a good idea, Raj. So we'll launch the first poll. So what happens is um, I will ask, this actually asks some questions about yourself. So there's obviously no right or wrong answers. I'm going to launch the poll and you'll see that the poll is how long have you lived in the area? And you've got options there. Have you been to a CFA meeting before? So you've got options there, yes, no, or can't remember. And how did you find out about this session? And this will help us in advertising and developing these sessions. So it was recommended by a family friend or social media, newspaper, 
community notice board or other, and then rate your knowledge around fire. If you can just give us some indication from very low to very high, what your knowledge of fire is, and that also gives us some indication of um, how to, where to, um, where to put this presentation, how to, um, to set it up. So I'll share the results then, and thank you everyone for, um, for participating in those and for pressing the submit button at the end of it. Some interesting results there, Raj. Yeah, I think, thank you, Julie, for that introduction. And, you know, this is a, quite a key part of our presentation. It really allows us to pitch what we're going to talk about and the depth to which we're allowed to talk about it. Uh, from what I can see, there's a lot of long-standing members of the Koji community joining us today, you know, sort of five to ten and ten plus years. A couple of newer members as well, but on the whole, the majority tend to be in that more senior or long-term um, place in Koji. Um, majority of you have not actually been to a CFA meeting before. And of course, yes, well, that's an interesting one. There's a cross section, but the dominant area where you find your information from was actually social media. And we'll find out the importance of that as we progress through this presentation. Rating your knowledge around fire, it's good to see that some of you have got medium to high knowledge, which is great, with a few people with some slightly lower level. Fire Safety Essentials will give you a basic introductory level of information. We can build on the information of those for you, of those of you who may know a bit about fire. So this is actually something that's tailored for you and your environment, the environment of Koji and the surrounds. Before I get carried away, because I'm, I'm both Julie and I are very passionate about delivering this presentation to you this afternoon, I'm going to close that poll and I suggest you do the same. And let's go through exactly what it is that we're actually going to be learning today. What are the key outcomes? It's not going to be death by PowerPoint, I assure you of that. It's going to be about giving you the critical information in bite-sized pieces so you get the fire message. You get the, the idea that fire is not to, be, um, not to be underestimated. Fire is a very key and critical danger. We're going to talk about some of those local risks in the area of Kaji. We're going to personalise that risk to Kaji. We're going to talk about what to expect from fire. What are the elements that make up fire? What are the key things that we should know about fire? We're also going to talk about the planning and decision-making phase. Critical. As an ex-Cub Scout, the one thing that was always driven into us was the idea of preparation. Preparation is the key. Having that level, level of preparedness, being ahead of, the, ahead of the situation, being in control, that's where we want to be. Of course, even the best laid plans can fail. And in that eventuality, we need to have plans B, C, D. And we're going to talk about some of those options as we progress. There's some of the things that we are going to learn. Let's, get, let's just get into it straight away. Understanding local fire risks. What do we mean by understanding local fire risks? Well, let's just, let me just put a bit of context to the area of Koji first before we progress. This fire safety essentials is tailored for the people that live in the Koji area and surrounds. We've, ex we've tried to explore the topography, that's the lay of the land, the makeup of the land, the routes in and out of Koji, the demographics of the community as well. Koji itself is located in the municipality of Moy, that's a given. The town's population is holding steady at around about 238. That's the 2016 census. So about 240 people or thereabouts live in Koji at the moment. Koji itself is a rural village in, a west, in Western Victoria. Again, nothing new there. We know that. That's, that's fine. It's situated on the Prentice Highway, 15 kilometres northeast of Warrnambool. So Warrnambool is the nearest large town. It is thought that the name was derived from an Aboriginal world word describing a kangaroo skin. Now, that's something that I didn't know until I did a bit of research. Kaji, Aboriginal word for kangaroo skin. How amazing. Kaji is on the Brucknall Creek, and the area was known by that name when the school opened in 1862. Kaji itself is set in a rich agricultural and dairy area. And I've driven many times through Kudji, and I'm familiar with the landscape that exists there, extensive farmland. 
One thing that both Julie and I have noticed in the time that we've been delivering presentations like this, generally face-to-face, -face, is the tremendous amount of community spirit that resides in communities like Kaji. That level of connection and connectedness to fellow members in the community. And this is the one thing that the Country Fire Authority, the CFA, take very seriously. It's at times of critical danger in the event of a bad fire day, and Kudji's had its fair share of fires, and we'll talk more about that shortly. It's at times of critical danger that communities come together to help one another. And this is pivotal when it comes to fire safety essentials. Let's move on to our next slide. And I'm not going to state the obvious. We all know that Victoria is, in actual fact, in one of the most bushfire-prone parts of the world. We have that mantra given to us all the time. You know, we talk about the US and California and the extent of fires and fire, fire growth and fire progression in that part of the world. We are no different. We are very vulnerable when it comes to fire. Our landscape, as shown by this slide, is a mixture of grassland, bushland. There's, often, there's a lot of mountainous area as well, forested area, and of course, farmland. And Kaji is no different in this respect. We have undulations around Kaji as well, hills that make up that environment. Fire has been present in the Australian continent for millions of years. And there's no doubt about that. There's significant proof of that across our landscape, a landscape that's been shaped by fire itself. In the early days and even to present times, fire has started by lightning. Our Aboriginal or Indigenous um, forebearers used tools that encouraged growth and, of course, the extent of grasslands to enhance hunting. This was their concept of caring for country. Fire also helped to reduce levels of fuel, and it kept the density of this fuel from getting out of control. It made it easier for them to be able to walk through. Interestingly, bushland record keeping or bushland fire record keeping only really started in earnest probably around 1851 at the time of early European settlement. So that kind of gives you some sort of context of the environment that we're talking about and some historical facts related to this area of Kaji. Let's take it to modern day and modern day, modern day fire, uh, fire control across this part of the state. What you're looking at the moment, it, looking at at the moment is a map. It's a map of what we describe as the weather districts. This map actually just depicts the different weather districts that exist across the state. The weather districts of East Gippsland, Northeast, Wimmera, Mallee, Southwest, to mention a few. The biggest take home from this, and something that we should all be very mindful of, is that each fire district will have its own level of fire risk. The risk in East Gippsland may be very different to that in the central region or the southwest. Why so? Okay, let's take this down to the next level, the seasonal outlook. What do I mean by the seasonal outlook? Well, this describes the overall weather trend. Exactly what is the weather trend in each weather district? I'm going to move on to the next slide that will allow us to understand the concept of the current weather pattern that we have been going through for the last month and a half, two months. And that is the La Nina effect. La Nina is good news for firefighting on the whole because Lena actually predicts that we're expected to reduce the, re the risk of prolonged fire activity across most of Victoria compared to last year. That's a fantastic thing, a reduction in prolonged fire activity. When we explore this just slightly more, I'm going to use the two, two maps of Australia the map on the left depicts temperature, and it's actually the median temperature range um, between the months of September through to November last year. And the map on the right depicts rainfall again in that same time frame. We know that La Nina means increased rainfall across much of Australia. 
And we've seen a lot of that already. And Coogee hasn't been spared its fair share of rain. Both Julie and myself live near Warnable. I'm in, in Woodford and Julie in Wangoon. We are active volunteer members of our local brigades. We know that it's been rather wet, but we also know that we've had periods of intense sunshine as well. What does this all mean? Well, Lelina itself is typified by cooler daytime temperatures, generally um, in the south of the tropics, and that's depicted by the map on the left-hand side. However, we do have warmer overnight temperatures, particularly in the north, and that's again typified by the map on the left-hand side. So cooler in the south during the daytime, warmer in the north during the nighttime. The last La Nina effect actually happened during the winter of 2017-18, and its cousin or counterpart came along, El Nina, during the following years of 2018-19. So both La Nina, where we are now, and El Nina have this almost complementary or duality of role. One weather pattern followed by the other weather pattern. And both are very different in makeup. Suffice to say for us at this moment in time, we need to know that we are in a La Nina weather pattern with increased rainfall. What does this mean? You know, we were talking about the seasonal outlook, but let's become a bit more local in this. Let's localize this seasonal outlook and talk about Kaji. Kaji itself is located in the part of Victoria that has experienced, as we've already said, slightly above average rainfall as a result of La Nina. As a result, there has been above average soil moisture. That's ripper news for our farmers. It's absolutely great news for those that work the land because it means that we have increased fertility. The, the growth of those crops will be actually well maintained because of the great moisture content. We've had years gone by where we've had drought and this is complete opposite now. We've had rich flows of water, which has had allowed for prolific growth of grass and our crops as well. There's enough moisture in, in our paddocks, in, our, in, in most of our grass, in the most of our ground service to make the grass grow well. But what we must remember at this moment in time that this grass will grow well, there's no doubt about that. However, it will also dry or cure very quickly. With some of the high daytime temperatures that we've seen in the last couple of months, you know, we've had some 30 plus, you know, sometimes reaching 40 degree days. These are all, all go towards drying or curing that high fuel load. What does that mean for Kaji? It means that like every fire season, there is a need to be prepared, to be prepared for a fire, probably a fast moving grass fire, that could happen as a consequence of ignition of this high fuel load. So some really important facts there about the weather pattern, our local and seasonal outlook, and what that means for fire behavior. I'm now gonna take that to the next level. And again, please use the chat function if you feel there's anything that you feel that you're not sure of or want more clarity over. Both Julie and I are happy to respond to those questions. Let's talk about local vegetation. What I'd like to do now is, you know, you're at home, you're watching this presentation, just have a quick look out the window. What kind of vegetation, what's the landscape looking like in your area? If you're in, in, in central Koji or on the periphery, wherever you are in that locality, let me know what the vegetation is. What is the landscape made up of? Are we talking bush? Are we talking grassland, woodland? What is the actual makeup there? So Raj, there's some um, chat coming through there. People are looking out on expansive areas of grassland. Um, the growth is very good. So um, some people are pleased about that. Um, some can see bush in the distance. So there's the grassland and then the bush in the distance, a bit like the um, top photo in our slide there. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you for your comments. And obviously the comments are still coming in. Yes, look, I think it would be fair to say from your comments that, the, that, there is, that this area of Koji is at risk of fast-moving grass fires. 
with the likelihood of ember attack probably coming from the nearby bush to the north, northwest, and the west as well. Now, I've mentioned a critical word there, embers, an ember attack. As we progress through this presentation, we'll learn more about embers. So just park that thought for a second while we continue to understand that grassland is susceptible, and particularly our vegetation around, the, around those grasslands, the trees particularly, which can act as ember traps, are susceptible to ember attack. Okay, so just remember that for one second. What does this mean for the community and the locality of Koji? Well, it means that when open grassland becomes ignited by fire, if there's a strong enough driving force, that fire will progress very rapidly. The driving force in this case, or in that case for any fire, is actually wind. The wind is the driver behind fire and fire direction. Yes, if we remember, you know, the very basics of the fire triangle, the elements of fuel, ignition and oxygen, we know that this fuel is plentiful, the fuel load. We've always spoken about the high fuel loads in a lot of our areas, not around our townships. We've already spoken about the ignition, you know, embers perhaps, or some other form of ignition, and of course oxygen. So let's not forget the importance of the wind. The wind will drive the fire. A change in wind causes a change in fire direction. And also let's not become too complacent about the topography. Let's not assume that because there are a number of hills separating us from an advancing fire, that we've got more time, but it's okay to be a bit more relaxed about the situation. In actual fact, that is not the case. When fires approach hills, they actually accelerate in speed. In fact, for every 10 degree increase in slope, a fire will double in speed. The reasons without getting too technical at this stage are the, the factors of convective heat and also radiant heat. More about radiant heat very shortly. So if you ever see a fire on, on the horizon and you think that you've got time because you're separated by hills, think again. The fire, in actual fact, will reach you much faster than you actually think. I'm going to move on to, well, no, Julie, I think let's, uh, yeah, we've actually looked at the responses from people regarding local vegetation, haven't we? And that was mainly grass. Open, expansive, yeah, okay, fantastic. Yeah, beautiful, yes. So perhaps um, before we actually talk a little bit more about local risk, we might launch another poll, Raj, that asks, okay. asks the audience their, um, their thoughts on what they think the local risks are. This is yeah. a multiple choice poll, so that means that you can tick one or more or all of these. So you will see that we're asking you what are some things that could make your local area a high risk area. So winding roads, trees hanging over or access roads and escape routes, high tourist areas in summer, um, speed of grass fires up to 40 kilometres an hour, numerous grass fires sparked by embers and high fuel load. Mm -hmm. So if you just like to tick one or more of those and um, that will give us some idea of what you think your local risks are before Raj moves on to talk about those. So thank you for that. I'll end the polling and share the results. Some interesting um, answers there, Raj. Yeah. Oh, look. Well, look, they're, they're, they're all 100%, aren't they? You know, every locality that we deliver this presentation to has its own level of local risk. There's some parts on the Gratian Road, as we mentioned the other day, Julie, that actually have a high tourist volume. And that itself is actually a local risk because a lot of these tourists tend to be somewhat fire naive. Koji doesn't quite have that amount of high tourists in summer, as is shown by this, this poll and the result that I'm looking at. But nevertheless, it's on the main road that links Melbourne to Warrnambool, Warrnambool to other parts of, this, of, of, of Victoria. So it's actually more of a, a transit route. So we need to make, make, bear that in mind. And in that regard, we have, do have a lot of large um, limbs that could potentially become um, um, fire prone and hence fall to roads and block access and exit routes as well. And that's, that's what we mean there by trees hanging on 
uh, over the access and escape routes. A lot some of you have of said that that's, that is a concern. Sorry, Raj. Yes, some of those um, smaller roads around Kaji, uh, off the main highway, do, do have those trees hanging over and they're narrow roads. Some of them yeah. are made, some are unmade. Mm. And, yeah, and, and from a fire safety essentials perspective, we often find that a lot of our emergency services vehicles will need to have priority access at the times of fire. These narrow roads will pose a risk, particularly if they're blocked, even by people trying to move away from fires and perhaps having left it too late and then leaving their vehicles. So we'll talk more about that shortly, but local risks need to be identified because they will form part of your fire plan. Your fire plan will be that document that you use to, to understand what you're going to do in the event of a fire situation. Again, as we progress through to this presentation, we'll get a better understanding of what that fire plan should, like, should look like. What are the main considerations? When we talk about the speed of grass fires, we've already spoken about the element of inclination on hills and how fires will travel faster uphill than downhill, and to be mindful of that. Fires will be sparked by embers. Again, that embers word, and I'll be playing you um, an animation to describe that a bit further. We do have a lot of high fuel load, and we've spoken about that as a consequence of La Nina and this prolific grass of, of growth of grass or road fuel. So these are some of the local risks. Let's, let's just file those away for a second and understand that they are an important consideration as we move forward. I'm gonna close this poll now and move on to the next element of our, our presentation, which is the wonderful hard work of our local brigade, the Kudji Brigade, worked tremendously hard. And, and Clayton Young, who I've spoken to a couple of times, is passionate about keeping his community safe and for them to have a knowledge of the capacity of their local brigade. The local brigade at their disposal has one trailer and one quick fill. This resource, this CFA resource, has to look after a population of 238 people spread out across 71 properties and dwellings. What we like to do at this stage is just pose that really rhetorical question, and that is, how confident would you be? How realistic is it for you to expect a CFA crew at your farm, at your business, at your home, in the event of a bad fire day. Actually, Raj, can, I'll just, just, can I just stop you for a minute there? Um, they, do, they do have a tanker. So oh, they do. Tanker. Oh, sorry. My apologies for that. Yeah. And one tanker they have as well. A, a tanker and then a quick fill on a trailer. Oh, so that's, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So, of course, yeah, of course they have. Um, we'd hate to think people to think that we've got a brigade that hasn't, ha that hasn't a tanker. Uh, in its, um, thank you, in its thank you, Julie, for that interjection. So, the, apologies, everybody. They, they the do have brigade does, and apologies to Clayton. I've missed that out. Sorry, Clayton. So, there is a trailer, but but that doesn't diminish no. the point that we're trying to make here, which is how confident would you be to have that service at your drive? You know, and bearing in mind that that tanker trailer quick thought will be pulled away to other fires other fires in the area, assisting other brigades. The message we'd like to leave with you here is take ownership. Understand that you may not have that brigade there and that you need to empower yourself with as much information about fire behaviour. This very presentation around fire safety essentials is designed to give you that level of understanding such that you can make an informed decision and be out of harm's way. Know when it's going to be a bad fire day. Understand that you need to be out of harm's way. So I might just leave that there while we just move on to the next slide, which is looking at what to expect from a fire. What are the key components of fire? One of them, well, actually two of them are, that I've already mentioned, and by far the very first one is that of ember attack. When we talk... Oh, actually, what I might do first of all is just give you a bit of context first. So we know that we live in a vulnerable part of the world when it comes to fires. We've already agreed on that. But did you know that Victoria's had its fair share of fires? Last summer, 
we saw huge fires in multiple parts of the state. What I want to try and do now is explore that a bit further by really getting underneath the skin of fire. I make no apologies for the animation that we are about to share with you. It's a very graphic and dramatic animation. If some of you feel that this might in any way cause you, uh, cause you any degree of discomfort, please feel free to look away. The, the animation will run for about a minute and a half or two minutes. Please feel free to join us at the end of the animation and we can discuss some of the learnings. So this is an animation. It's entitled Ember Attack. And I'm about to share it with you now. So as I say, as I say, look away if you feel that it's going to um, cause you any level of distress. Ember Attack, thank you. During a bushfire, embers will reach your home long before the flames do. Ember attacks are the most common way that houses catch fire. Embers are burning leaves, twigs and pieces of bark. They help the bushfire spread by starting spot fires ahead of the main fire front. Short distance ember attacks happen when leaves and small pieces of bark are blown from burning trees. The intense shower of sparks that forms fills the air with hot, burning embers, which will land on nearby vegetation and properties. The hot embers can easily land and get into your clothes and burn your skin, eyes and airways. Small fires will start all around you and quickly become uncontrollable. The resulting chaos creates confusion as the fire seems to come from many directions meaning it will be difficult to make good decisions about your safety. The experience will be physically exhausting and emotionally traumatic. Long distance ember attack is caused by large bushfires that generate intense heat. As the hot air rises, it forms a column of smoke that sucks in air like a vacuum, increasing the intensity of the fire. The updraft in the column lifts embers, like large pieces of burning ribbon bark, hundreds of metres into the air, where strong winds can carry them many kilometres beyond the fire front. On Black Saturday, embers travelled more than 30 kilometres ahead of the main fire. When these embers land, they often start fires where leaves naturally accumulate, like in gutters, doorways and garden beds. So while you might think you're safe when a bushfire is far away, embers can fall from the sky and land around your home long before you even know there's a fire. But remember, your home isn't the only thing under threat during an ember attack. By the time you realise the danger, it might be too late as escape routes become jammed. Embers can also start fires on roads and block them completely, making late evacuation dangerous or impossible. That's why leaving early, before a fire starts, is always your safest option. And that's one thing that both Julie and I will continue to reinforce um, during this presentation. Leaving early is always going to be your best option. Whenever I watch this animation, and I've seen it a few times now, I still get that same kind of spine chingling sensation of how crazy this world of fire actually is, how unpredictable fire behavior is. We know about ember attack. We know that, it, it, that the embers travel a long distance ahead of the fire front, as we mentioned earlier. And if your property is not prepared, it can perhaps be an ember trap. As exemplified by the video and the animation, any debris that might be in your spouting, any fuel load that might be around your home. We spend a lot of time through the CFA talking about property preparation. And there is a service that we offer called the Property Advice Visit Service. It's a 
or a PAVS service, as the acronym is, PAVS, P-A-V-S. It's a community door knocking service. Uh, I've been part of this service for, for a number of years now. A community door knocking service that talks to community members, residents, etc., around property preparation. The need to have a level of preparation. It's that P word again, preparation, preparedness, being ready, being ready in the event of a fire. Having a property that's fire ready will buy you time. We often talk also about um, Ember attack is one way that properties can be impacted. Another way is what we call direct fuel impact or di direct flame impact. And if you, there's an old adage that if you have fuel to your door, you will have fire to your door. And what we're talking about there is the continuity of fuel between you and the advancing fire front. If we have a fast moving grass fire approaching you, that fire can only be halted or slowed or deterred if there's a break in that continuity of fuel. Through the property advice visit, we suggest having a driveway, having some sort of physical barrier that will stop that progression or that continuity of fuel. A gravel driveway is a perfect example of that. Let me just say a few more, more words now about Ember Attack before we move on to and the next component of, of fire behavior, which is radiant heat. As was stated in the animation, Ember Attack is by far the biggest cause of property loss. The very images of the scarring that happens across our, our countryside when we have a grass fire, intentional or otherwise, is very damaging, it's very hurtful, but we do also need to be mindful of what we call the, that the land looks to burn. And we refer to the germination of seeds in that regard, a practice that was used by our indigenous people for many thousands of years. I'm now going to move on to the second component of fire behavior, a very important component called radiant heat. And while I'm finding this particular animation, um, perhaps Julie, you could do a simple introduction. Um, thank you, Raj. Yes, as Raj says, ember attack is the biggest cause of prop one of the biggest causes of property loss during a fire. And people often think that ember attack only happens in bush. But as you could see by that previous slide, ember attack does happen during grass fires, especially hot, fast moving grass fires. And it's the same with radiant heat. People think you need a big bushfire for the radiant heat to develop. But as our animation will show, that a grass fire also has the ability to put out, put out that heat, enough heat to damage, um, to damage you and your property. Thank you, Julie. And, and again, we must emphasize the very sensitive nature of this animation. It is designed to have full impact. Um, I've, I've worked in the healthcare industry for many years, and we, we've always found that messages are, are delivered more effectively if they do have an element of shock, the real factor that this is really what's going to happen. We're not pretending that this is what's going to happen, but if you behave like this, this is what will happen. And the same is in fire behavior. We know that fire is a very clear and present danger. We know that the risks are out there. We know about ember attack. I'm about to show you radiant heat. Victoria is one of the most bushfire prone parts of the world. Every summer, bushfires threaten properties and lives. But did you know it's not the flames that kill most bushfire victims? No, it's the radiant heat. Most victims die from the effects of radiant heat long before they're reached by the flames. Radiant heat is what you feel when you sit next to a campfire. If a campfire heats up to two kilowatts per square meter, you'll feel that it's too hot and will want to move back from the fire. If you don't, this amount of radiant heat is enough to cause burns and blisters in as little as 40 seconds. 12 kilowatts, it can cause some materials like dry timber to ignite. A bushfire can reach 100 kilowatts and the effects can be truly catastrophic. 
For humans, radiant heat can cause burns from 100 meters away and cause a dangerous increase in body temperature. Radiant heat can cause the rapid onset of heat stroke. Heat stroke damages your brain, meaning you won't be able to concentrate to make good decisions as the fire arrives. Other impacts include severe damage of internal organs and death. There are some things you can do if you're caught in a fire. Cover your skin with long-sleeved natural fibre clothing, like wool. It's also useful to know that radiant heat only travels in straight lines and can't bend around corners. So, sheltering behind or inside solid structures may help protect you. But be aware, radiant heat will travel straight through glass. The best defence against radiant heat is a simple one. If you're not anywhere near a bushfire, its radiant heat can't hurt you. Leaving early is always your safest option. Just as the previous animation, I think this animation speaks for itself. It is powerful and it's designed to get the message across. You do not need to be anywhere near radiant heat. And you will not be anywhere near radiant heat because you have left. You'd have left and you'd have left early. One thing that the CFA do do, um, which is uh, fantastic on their part, uh, is they conduct interviews um, or general discussions with, and they're very sensitive and empathetic in this regard, and they'll talk to people that have been impacted by a fire. And often the words and the statements that come out at this time are extremely powerful, and they give you a sense, a sense of futility, a sense of loss, a sense of, crikey, I should never have been there. I'm going to show you the next slide, which contains some of these testimonials, these statements from people. And I think they speak for themselves. And as we, we speak about these elements of emotional intelligence and knowing, and knowing the risk that's out there, I'm going to just find some real life testimonials from people now as well. And these will give you some idea of the extent, the extent of loss that people feel, the sense of hopelessness. And I think it's important for us to understand that when we're in a situation like this, we wish we probably weren't. This particular footage is a real life account from people that decided to stay and fight fire. And these are some of their thoughts. This part of our presentation, again, is, can be quite sensitive, maybe to some of you, so feel free to look away. It's entitled, I'll Never Do That Again. 10 years ago, when every, all the dams were full and the tanks were full and there was plenty of water, I probably would have stayed and I would have died. Nothing went the way we might have anticipated. Whatever preparations you put into place, you only need something small to go wrong. You know, in, in future, I, I don't think we'd want to put the kids through that sort of trauma, I guess. Yeah, wouldn't put the kids through that again. If it was my choice, I wouldn't stay again. If, another, if we had another day like that, uh, if I had the opportunity to get out, I would go before the fire even got here. You know, those, those closing words from that particular um, video that we've just shown you, you know, before the fire even got here. And, and that's the underlying core of this message that we're giving to you this afternoon. It's all about being out of harm's way understanding the risk and mitigating that risk. 
Uh, both Julie and I are passionate about risk management and being risk savvy, moving away and eliminating risk. If you know what the risks are, why put yourself in harm's way? If we understand the very nature of embers, if we understand the intensity of radiant heat, why be there? Why increase your stress burden? Why make it more difficult for you to make those informed decisions? We've spoken a fair bit already about understanding what it's like to be in a fire situation, and we try to give you a very graphic description of that. I think what we'd like to do now, Julie, would be to launch a vote, uh, another poll. Thank you, Ash. This poll is going to ask you, I want you to think about what you've just seen um, about the fires, that the animations you've just seen, the impact of um, the impact of embers and radiant heat. This poll asks you, what do you think would impact your ability to make good decisions? This is a multiple choice. So you can check, tick one or more of those. Just scroll down and make sure you hit submit at the end of the poll. Um, stress, rapidly changing situation, things not going to plan, not having enough time or communication breakdown. So thank you for that. I'll end the polling and share the results. And I think people have understood that stress is one of the main reasons, the main elements that will impact on making good rational decisions, but each of the others will do as well. Absolutely, Julie. I think, I think the real take home is when I see those results that you've just shared with us, you know, 100% across all of those, they are all indicators that will increase our stress load. As, as human beings, generally, we do not have the capacity to handle stress well. Some of us handle it better than others, but the majority will often crumble under stress. And this is further impacted because we, we tend to get a heightened stress response when we're not in control, when we know that things are not going to plan around us. And how can they go to plan? Because we, we don't now know anything about this alien thing called fire. It's foreign to us. You know, we don't know how fire behaves. We don't know what embers are or what radiant heat is. All we know is that it's not a nice place. When the situation is changing rapidly around you and your element of control is lost. When you have that element of time that's thrown into the mix as well. Time is a real stress, a manifestation, manifestation of stress, isn't it? Over time, it, 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 it makes you have to think quicker. And often in a situation like this, we can't think quicker. We become irrational. Our focus is lost. We do things that we probably wouldn't normally do, but that's because we're in this confused space, this frustrated, confused space. Ultimately, communication breakdown, not knowing where your family is, not knowing what's happening to neighbours, dear loved ones or your pets or other elements of your life. Not having that level of preparation will make you become overloaded with stress. Do we really want to be in that situation? Do we really want to create more stress for ourselves? Leaving early, having a plan, understanding the triggers that will make you activate that plan. That's the way forward. And that's what both Julie and I and the CFA are strong advocates for. Leaving early, create your plan, make sure that it works, have, have variations of that plan and be the, get, get out of harm's way, mitigate that risk. I'm gonna close my poll now by just crossing it out there. If you'd like to do the same, I'm going to move on to the next element of our presentation. Thanks for all the comments that are coming through. As I say, both Julie and I are monitoring those. But as we move forward, we want to move into another space now on this fire essentials journey, which is how do you know if there is a fire? What's your go-to? Where do you look? Who do you ask? What do you use? So let's pop down the chat function, I think, Julie. How do people know if there is a fire? So if you just think about um, how do you know when it's going to be a, um, a bad fire day? How do you know if there's a fire in your area? 
how do you know when to actually in, um, to enact your plan? So think about all those things. And while people are putting in their chat, um, while they're typing in the chat function, we might have a look at some of the ways that people can find out if there's a fire or if there's a possibility of a fire. So if we look at the fire danger ratings, so these ratings um, come out the day before. So they're usually declared the day before a bad fire day or any day in the fire season, in the summer season, fire danger um, season. So your low, moderate, your high, and your very high. Everyone's seen these. These are the fire danger ratings. And everyone's seen these on the side of the road, on TV, on radio. But I just wonder how many know exactly what they mean. What do each of these things mean? So while you're using your chat function to say why, how you know there might be a fire in your area, I'm going to open up another poll and ask you, what do you think the fire danger rating means? Is it an indication of how likely a fire will start or an indicator of how bad a fire would be if one were to start? And does anyone know how many code red days have been in the southwest in the last five years? And how many extreme or severe days have happened in the southwest in the last five years? This will just give us an indication of what your knowledge is. And um, don't worry about what your answer is. We can't see who's ticking what, who's voting for what. So just give us your idea, see what you think. I'm going to end the polling there and share the results. It's good to see some people did think that the FDR is an indication of how likely a fire will start, but in actual fact, it's an indicator of how bad a fire would be if there were one to start. So a fire could start on any of those days, but the higher it is, extreme or um, severe or code red, that indicates how bad a fire will be and how hard it will be to control. Code red days are the worst possible um, fire danger days, and there have been none declared in the southwest in the last five years. So there have been no code red days in the southwest. There have been in Victoria, but not in the southwest. And there has been six severe or extreme days. There have been quite a number of high days, but there has been only six. So I'll stop sharing those results now and we might talk a little bit more. It's good to see that people are putting in the chat how they might know that there is a fire and we'll talk about some of those things a bit later. But I might now um, just talk a little bit more about what the fire danger ratings actually mean. So as I said, a low, moderate, high or very high day fire can start just because it's coolish just because the sun mightn't be shining as bright or the wind mightn't be very high. It might be that it is windy, but not very hot. Fire can still start. So on any of those conditions, but it's highly likely that it will be controlled. Throw the resources at it, get the fire brigades out, and it will be controlled. But we come to a severe day, and that's when we start to worry about how easily it will be to control a fire. So on a severe day, you would expect hot, dry, and possibly windy conditions. And if a white fire were to start and take hold, it may be uncontrollable. On an extreme day, this is when it would be extremely hot, dry, and windy. And if a fire were to start and take hold, it will be uncontrollable. It will be unpredictable. It will be fast moving. Spot fires will start and it will move quickly and will come from many directions. So it will be fought, there will be the brigades out there, but it will be uncontrollable, it'll be unpredictable and nobody wants to be in that situation. On a code red day, that is the worst possible bushfire or grass fire conditions. Homes are not designed and people are not designed to withstand fires in these conditions. So the safest place to be on a high risk bushfire or grass fire day is out of danger, is not to be there. So leaving on high risk bushfire or grass fire areas night before or early the day, that early on that day is the safest option. Don't wait and see and avoid forest areas, thick bush and long dry grass. 
know your triggers, make a decision about when you will leave, where you will go, and how you get there, and when you will return. What if you can't return? So you need to keep an eye on those fire danger ratings and use them as your trigger to enact your plan. So the question is then, where do we get our information from? How do we know when there's a fire? And I might pass it back to you, Raj. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Julie. You know, the, the biggest take home that we can take from the fire danger rating is use it as a tool, use this as a trigger to understand when you're going to activate your fire plan. As Julie very clearly said, we're, we're not designed to withstand heat, but the radiant heat animation clearly show that. And of course, our properties, our homes are not designed to a fireproof standard to survive a code red day, or even perhaps an extreme day in some cases. We need to be out of harm's way. Use the guide of the fire danger rating to say, hey, it's going to be a severe day. I know what that means. It is going to be hot. It's going to be windy and the fire may well be uncontrollable. I'm gone. I'm leaving. You know, the house can be replaced. All my possessions can be replaced. I can't. I need to leave with my family and protect us. So that's, that's the message here. But as Julie so rightly said, you know, we, we live in a world now full of a tremendous amount of, of communication, communication channels. Long gone are the old days of traditional communication sources, the conversations, conversations the chat, the, the, the coffee, overhearing the conversation in the coffee shop. Maybe someone down the road, a neighbor tells you something. Maybe you've heard it on the radio or the newspaper. These are what we call very much old school. You know, that was the traditional way of knowing what was happening in the neighborhood or the locality. We are now today in the modern 21st century bombasted with information from digital platforms. The airways are full of tweets, of chat, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, a whole heap of communication comes our way. I often refer to this as infobesity, that huge overload of information. The understanding here is that this information is certainly not always credible, not always evidence-based, not always timely. Is it legitimate? Don't know. From our perspective and for the purposes of this presentation, these are what we recall, what we regard as informal means of communication. They are not number one, they are not priority. At the CFA, we would strongly recommend that in the event of an emergency event of any kind, that you look to these types of digital applications, means of communication to give you real time, evidence-based, legitimate information in real time, to give you an indication of what the fire activity is happening in your area and what the emergency services have got planned or what's happening. These will be your link to the outside world that you can trust. By far, one of the most important elements in this is the Vic Emergency app. If any of those listening today have not got the emergency, Vic Emergency app on there downloaded to their mobile phones, I strongly suggest that you make that a priority. The Vic Emergency app will give you an indication of fire activity wherever you are. It allows you to personalize the settings so you can actually view your area immediately and the bigger area. If you're traveling out of your area, it'll give you an indication of planning the best route out, avoiding those fire hotspots. So that's the Vic Emergency app. While we're on this slide, I just wanna make particular reference to local news. Let me just add a bit of context here. In the event of a bad fire day, it's often the case that our communications will go down. A fire event can be a very, a very harrow and disturbing experience. It can be quite disorientating too. As one of the animations showed at the beginning, it becomes a dark, noisy, hot, smoky, 
an uncomfortable space by any stretch of imagination. Your only means of communication with the outside world in this kind of environment will be a battery operated radio. Using this radio to link to the local ABC news on 774, emergency channel, emergency radio dedicated to giving you advice and keeping you as safe and as sane as possible. We strongly recommend that a battery operated radio forms a key part of your emergency bag, your leaving kit, the bag that you grab with all your essentials in the event of a bad fire day. I'll be talking a bit more about the emergency bag shortly. There are a number of other recognized legitimate platforms there as well, inclusive of the EMV, the Emergency Management Victoria Online app, as well as, of course, the Vic Emergency Hotline. So look to these as your formal sources of information in the event of a fire. What we're going to do now is examine the Vic Emergency app in a bit more detail, such that we get an understanding of the, the messaging system that the CFA have used for a number of years to give you advice around fire activity. Julie? Thanks, Raj. The CFA have developed these warnings um, that are given out on the Vic Emergency app on TV, on, um, you might see it on the screen running across the TV news. So these are messages of warnings if there's an incident in your area. So first of all, you might receive, and they're not necessarily linear. The first one you receive might be an emergency warning, but I'll just explain what each of them mean. So an advice warning means it's an incident is occurring or has occurred in, the, in your area. You need to access information, monitor conditions. Um, there might be, it's, it might be a notification that the activity in the area has even subsided. So it might be that you can see smoke and I'll tell you why you can see smoke. The fire might be out, but the smoke might still be hanging around. So it's just an advice. Monitor your situation. Keep an eye on what's going on. A watch and act is an, is, means that an emergency is actually developing. Now is when you need to take action. You need to monitor the situation. You need to know how to protect yourself and others. You need to actually act. There is an emergency and you need to act. An emergency warning means that you are in imminent danger and you need to take action. You will be impacted. And your action might only be to shelter in place. Might be too late to actually move from your locality. So our message, main message is don't wait for a warning. And Raj will talk a little bit more about how you get those warnings and why you shouldn't wait a little bit later. There are a couple of other messages that CFA also have, an evacuation message. That's a recommendation that you should evacuate. You should put into place the procedures to evacuate. There might be um, a, by the direction of the police, way of evacuating the area. CFA may help, but they can't tell you to leave your property. And then community information is usually a newsletter, and that contains updates for communities affected by an emergency. So that's a notification that after the incident has occurred, there's no threat to the community. It gives you information of where you can go for help, what services available, what you can do to improve your situation. But once again, our message is do not wait for a warning. This next little animation might actually give you some idea of why that is important that you don't wait for a warning. So it is a hot day, it's a hot and windy day and you're in your house, you're um, checking the Vic Emergency app because you know it is a hot and windy day and you've got the curtains closed because you want to keep the place cool and you're watching, say you're watching Netflix, everything's fine. And then a fire starts some distance from you, but it starts. It's not going to be until 10 minutes or no, five minutes, let's say after the fire has started, that it will be reported. So in that, when it's reported, go straight to the brigade and the brigade jump in their trucks and they head off to fight this fire. By now, it could be 10 minutes. 10 minutes and the CFA has now been notified that there's a fire and they're preparing to put out a message. 
So the next thing they put out is an advice message. Remember the advice message was that there's an incident in your area. So that's all very well for people at the other end of this line, but for you in your house, it's too late. By the time you receive the emergency message, which means imminent danger, the fire has passed you. So you can see that you haven't even received a watch and act message. That's what we mean by you might be ahead of the warning. So you might even be the one who actually reports the fire. You might be the one who sees the fire in the distance. You're not then going to wait for a warning before you're not going to wait for a watch and act before you actually act on it. So 30 minutes after the fire starts, the fire is huge and it is well past your place. It is too late. So by if you so the um the take-home message is do not wait for a warning because you might be ahead of the warning. So what is the best way to know if there's a fire? How can you tell if there's a fire in your area? Well, this, this, this isn't rocket science, you know. I, I know some community members that live in, in the Kudji area. And, and one of the key things that, 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 is, that is true of this community is their connection to the land on which they work. We already said that, you know, Kudji's got um, a few businesses in, in the neighbourhood, but primarily it's dairy and grazing. You know, it's people, farmers that live on the land that form the bulk, bulk of that relatively medium-sized population. Using your senses, often our farmers have got a very intrinsic link to the land that they work on. They know and they can sense when things aren't right. When the sky turns a different colour, when it's unusually hot for some bizarre reason, you know, they know when things aren't quite right. Visually, we can see if things aren't right. We can see smoke on the horizon. We can see a change in the color of the sky. We can see ash in the air or perhaps even embers. We're using our senses to make the most of an informed decision to understand the environment and what we can do. We can listen for fire. We can hear large limbs perhaps falling or the, the, the crackle or crunch of wood as it becomes ignited or, 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 or sparks up. We can hear the bird services or unusual activity in our area that's indicative of something going on. And of course, we can use our sense of smell and the ability to smell smoke. And what does that really mean for us? We've spoken up until now about the many factors that go towards understanding fire behaviour. We've spoken about the fire danger rate in the FDR and the importance of using it as a tool, as a trigger to make a decision. We've spoken about the importance of using credible information sources to make these informed decisions. Let's talk more the formal, the Vic Emergency app, Emergency Management Victoria. Let's also not be too complacent about the need to not wait for a warning. We don't wait for a warning. The moment we sense that something's not right, the moment we feel that, hey, this isn't going the way it should go, we need to enact our fire plan and leave and leave early. An effective fire plan will get you out of harm's way and protect you, your family, your community. And that's the best way to be. That's a win-win, that's a good outcome. And at the CFA, that's all that we request. Leave the firefighting to the professionals, leave your property. If there's a change in wind direction and the fire doesn't come or damage your property, hey, it's all good, you can go back. In any case, your property can be replaced, you can't. What I'd like to do now is bring together all of the elements that we've spoken about so far. And this is all about planning and decision-making. It's the idea that we've got all this knowledge now, we know what fire is about, and we want to be out of harm's way. What Julie and I have done now is we've put together um, a pretend situation, a hypothetical. We've tried to make it as real as possible, so we bring to go, get, there, get together those elements of the fire danger rating, 
radiant heat, the big emergency app, and some of the other factors when it comes to how we feel when we're under pressure, when there's a fire around us. It brings together the element of preparation. Preparation is the key. I'd like to hand over to Julie now as she goes through this pretend situation. Thanks, Raj. So this is a hypothetical, and I want you to put yourself in this situation. Be this person who I'm talking about, and as I talk you through it. It's, you live just out of Kudji, um, and it's a severe day. It's hot and windy. You know it's going to be severe because the day is usually declared the day before, but you've got a few things that you've got to do in Warnable. You've got an appointment you've got to go to, you've got to see um, a friend. So you decide that you'll get up early in the morning and you'll head into Warnable so that you're back home before the heat of the day, before the worst part of the day. So you jump in your car and you're driving towards Warnable. And as you're driving towards Warnable, you can see that it's windy because there's a few branches falling off trees, leaves, just little twigs jumping, falling onto the road. You can feel the heat through the window. You pump up the air conditioning and you think, hmm, it's just after eight and it's starting to feel hot. So you check your big emergency app when you stop at um, you get into Warnable and you see that there's no fires in the, in the area. It's still hot and hot and um and windy but you go get on and you do your things you go and visit your friend you go and pick up your stuff that you need you might go to an appointment then you decide it's time to head back you start stop in at the local cafe and you think i'll just get a coffee on my for my drive back and you grab the coffee and as you're getting the coffee you hear someone say that a fire has started nobody's surprised because it is an extreme day and it's jump on the big emergency act app and you find that it isn't too far away from your house but the indicator that tells you where the fire is and the areas it's going to impact isn't near your house yet so you think yeah I've got time to race back in I've got everything prepared I know what I want to do so I'm going to race back to Kudji grab the stuff I need and get back to Warrnambool you've already said that you know you've got somewhere that you can stay in Warrnambool you just need to get these things make sure your house is um, right, you know how that you should put your map in, your mat in off the door. So you jump in your car and you drive to Kaji and you have been stopped. The road is closed. There are police there. You wind down your window and you say, but I live there. I just want to get back to my house. And they tell you it's not safe to go any further. They don't know how long it will be before you can get through. There is a fire. You'll have to find somewhere else to go until the road is reopened. What would you do? How are you going to spend the next, the rest of the day, that night, the next day perhaps? Can't go home. What will you do now? What does this mean for you? How are you feeling? What sort of things are you thinking? What sort of things do you think you need to do at this stage? What I might do is while you're thinking about that, so I want to launch another poll. So this poll will talk about that decision making and that planning, whether you were prepared for something like this. So the first question is, what would you be doing on an average Wednesday in summer, middle of the middle of the week? Hot, what would you be doing? Home, work, or at holidays? Thinking about last summer. Would you have been prepared to spend a few nights away from home in an emergency like this? You were stopped on the road and told to turn around and go back. You can't get through. Would you have been prepared for that? And then once again, thinking about last summer, would you have had an emergency kit packed? Something in your car that you could use, the clothes, change of clothes, important documents, photos. So if you just tick, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just simply what you think, what, what you know about yourself. So I'll end the polling there and I'll share your results. Except, yeah, most people were either home or at work. Not many people are on holidays at that or on a vacation at that time of the year. Um, would they have been prepared to spend away from home in an emergency situation? Half and half. Some would, some wouldn't. Some would, not many people would have that emergency kit though with some clothes. 
So I'll stop sharing those results and I want you to think back to our scenario. This time, it's the same day. Let's say it's the same day. You hear that there's a fire in your area, same. You check your Vic Emergency app, you see that that area is a bit further away from your home. So you do think to yourself, right, I've got enough time to grab, run home and grab the stuff that I need. You haven't got anything really prepared, but you have some idea of what you want to get. So you drive home. It's time you get through, through to your house. You park in your driveway. As you get out of the car, you can smell smoke. It's really windy and it's hot. So immediately you check your big emergency app to see where the fire is. You know there's a fire. You can see that. You can smell it. And the little yellow triangle, the, the indicator of where the fire will impact, is still a fair way away from you. So you decide, yep, okay, I've got time to run inside and grab a few things. You know in your head what you're thinking about, what you need to get. So you run in and you grab your passport. You're going on holidays in a few weeks, you need that. Insurance papers, you've heard that people in fires lose their insurance paper and that it's hard to prove who they are. You grab them. Oh, your cat's sleeping on the bed, yes, that's, she's easy to grab because she's right there. You put her in her cage and you run back out of the car. So all this time you're running in and out, thinking of something else that you might need, but, and you're checking the app. You're checking the app as you go. You, the little yellow indicator, it's getting a little bit bigger, but it's still not right near your property. It's not near the edge of your property. So back in again, oh, for once you've actually used your camera rather than your phone to take some photos, you want that. So you run back in to get the camera, it's sitting on the table. It is taking a lot longer than you thought to do this because you keep thinking of things that you hadn't thought about when you were driving home. Keep running in and out, keep checking your app. Then as you get to the car to put that camera in, throw things in the back seat, you notice you can smell the smoke a little bit stronger than before. You can see the wind creating little whirly whirlies around the place. And you can see embers falling. Got a fair amount of grass around your house, but you can still see embers falling out of the sky. And then you see one catch light in that pile of leaves that you thought you were going to break up in the next day or two. So they're falling on your home. You look around. They're falling on your roof. And you think, I've run out of time. You're now thinking, what should I have done differently? What could have I done differently to be not in this situation? So I want you to think about what sort of things you could have done differently. If you're in this, take a breath and think about what you could have done differently if you're in this situation. You can imagine that in me just talking about it and you listening to that, your adrenaline is pumping, you're putting yourself in that situation, you're feeling for that person who is running back and forwards in the car and you're probably thinking, well, I would have done something differently. I wouldn't have got myself into that situation. So use the chat function to let us know what you would have done differently, what you could have been done, done differently. And yes, I see some people have said, be prepared. And it, that has what is what Raj has been talking about right through this whole presentation, is that prepared. Know what the day is going to bring, know what the fire conditions are, and be prepared for that situation. Have things already packed by your door, some people have said. Others have said, don't go back. Once they're in Warrnambool, they'd stay in Warrnambool. Do you know, it, it might seem like both Julie and I are sort of uh, bombarding you with lots of, lots of things to think about and do. And, and interestingly, these are really important considerations. You know, where are the children? Uh, who's looking after the horses? Who's looking after Mavis who lives down the road and uh, she's, she's on her own and she's, she's confined to a wheelchair? What's the plan for other community members? Uh, where's young Joey? Is he still at football practice and, and is your husband on that tractor on the farm just down the road from Pudgy? These are all important considerations that actually impact on your stress and your ability to think clearly. 
you might even have the thought of grabbing a hose pipe and trying to put some of those ember or spot fires out. Is that an option? You might even think about, okay, well, look, I'm, I'm going to leave everything. I'm just going to jump in the car and go. Is the road clear? How do you know if it's clear? And if it is clear, which way are you going to turn when you get to the bottom of the road? Are you not going to go towards the fire? Which way? Where is the fire? All of these really important life-saving decisions are so crucial. And it's important that you never find yourself in this kind of space where you are under so much pressure to make these important decisions. And that is why leaving early, reducing your stress burden, mitigating the risk has to be the only way out. Be prepared, as Julie said, have that emergency bag. Don't come back for it. Leave with it in the first instance. You should have left with it in the morning. Wouldn't that have been a better option? Wouldn't it have been great to actually implement your fire plan when you knew it was going to be an extreme day? These are just some of the thoughts that are going through and I'm hoping that this hypothetical situation has sparked some of those thoughts with you this afternoon. Fire is unpredictable, we already know that, but we can stay safe by being ahead of the fire game, being ahead with our preparation and our consideration of those others in our community. This is a, a slide just showing a quick summary of the really key and pertinent points that we've been trying to get across this afternoon. Planning and having a plan, the importance of the Big Emergency app, get it downloaded to your smartphone. We do have the capacity to offer you a bushfire planning workshop and we're happy to organize that. There is a resource link available that will allow you to make that association. And even contacting Clayton, your brigade captain, or contacting me directly by Clayton, that would be fine and we can organize that. I'd like to say just a few words about um, the perspective that we have on, on the pandemic that's still around. Yes, you can still leave early. You can leave a high risk fire area on a day of high fire danger. If you are in self-isolation at the time of this exit, make sure that wherever you're going to, people know that you are isolating and maintain a safe, a safe COVID plan. You may also travel for the purposes of preparing your property for the fire season. That's totally allowable and understandable. It might be a good idea to check the Department of Health and Human Services website for the latest developments on the pandemic and COVID-19. It's, it's a moving space at the moment and changes quite regularly. So get yourself updated and understand what, COVID, what the COVID limitations are. I'm going to now move on to the final stages of our pres presentation this afternoon. I thank you for all the chat uh, that's coming through and for your um, cooperation with the uh, polls as well. We're getting some really great information. Let's discuss survival options. Of course, we don't ever want you to be in a survival situation because you have left a long time ago. But should you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to implement some, some survival techniques, Here's some, some ideas for you. We acknowledge that the best laid plans can actually fail and we need to have options. Early on, we saw a, a, an animation about radiant heat. This particular slide demonstrates the crucial need to keep as much of your exposed skin as covered as possible to reduce the risk of radiant heat damage. We know that radiant heat is the biggest killer when it comes to fires. So why risk skin exposure? Give yourself the best possible chance of survival, cover up. Cover up with natural fiber clothing from top to tail. Have these elements of clothing as an essential part of your emergency bag, together with other items of emergency needs, such as a torch, and the battery operated radio, water for hydration, any important documents, preferably on a, on a flash drive, a woolen blanket, important medication that you might need, pet medicine, your pet cage, and the list goes on. These components should be identified in your fire plan and then kept ready at all times at a place that you can access them easily. 
we spoke earlier about radiant heat and the only way of affording protection from radiant heat is to shelter behind or inside solid objects. They will afford some element of protection. And remember, radiant heat only travels in straight lines. It doesn't bend around corners, so they might be good refuge places. Well, make sure you don't park yourself near or stand near any glass. Glass has, the radiant heat will travel directly through glass and the glass may explode or fracture, causing harm. The radiant heat is a precursor to the advancing fire front. The radiant heat will kill way before the fire front actually arrives. It's invisible and it travels laterally in straight lines. When we talk about an advancing fire front and the threat of ember attack and the ongoing radiant heat, it may be possible for you to seek shelter in a water course, a place of refuge in a water course, such as a river, a dam, or a swimming pool. There are other places of refuge, not totally advisable, but in the event of emergency, one could seek refuge in a stationary vehicle of some kind. And Julia might give you some tips around some of the do's and don'ts in that space. So when, if you are, thank you, Raj, if you are sheltering in a water course, make sure it's a large water course. Um, it's every, all of these places are still dangerous and it's still not recommended. But as Raj says, if it's an emergency, if it is, if there is no other way out, then these are some places you could shelter. An air, a place of cleared vegetation. So in an open place where there is little vegetation that includes grass and trees. So a large paddock might even be a burned paddock where the fire has already been through. If you are in a car, never, I have to stress, never drive through fire. But if you are in a car when you are threatened, then there are some things that you can do. Remember, cars are not designed to get you, to protect you in a fire. They are designed to get you from A to B. So if you're caught in a fire, there's just a couple of things that you could do. You need to get down low. You need to park off the road. You need to get off the road. You don't want to cause an accident with, or block the road for emergency services. But if you get off the road, don't get it off the road into bush, into the middle of the bush or into long grass get into a place of cleared vegetation. Um, and once again, it could be a burnt area already. Get down low, get away from the glass and that radiant heat. This is where your woolen blanket comes into play. Cover yourself with that woolen blanket. Keep hydrated to mitigate some of those effects of radiant heat on your body. And monitor the situation. It will happen if you are in a burnover, if the fire goes through or past you, it will happen very quickly. It'll be very noisy. It will be very hot. It'll be very um, scary. So monitor the situation. As soon as the fire is passed, get out of the car. Keep, have, have um, your mobile phone if it is still working. Call for help immediately. Don't run out onto the road. Don't run into the path of a fire truck, keep your lights on so people know where you are. But once again, the best place to be would be not to be there. If you leave early, you will not get find yourself in that situation. Thank you, Julie. Now, I might just make reference to the next slide. Um, perhaps this slide shouldn't really be here because we don't really want you to be seeking a last resort. We'd rather you were away, as Julie said, from that fire danger, from the threat of fire. You should have gone and gone a long time ago. But we understand that some of us may leave it a bit late. And consequently, places of last resort, as these places are called, may offer some form of protection from the radiant heat. They're referred to as bushfire neighbourhood safer places or places of last resort. And the name is indicative of a last resort, right down at the bottom of your list. They will be not pleasant places. Don't expect superior luxury or a, a hot cup of coffee or tea when you arrive. 
It ain't going to be like that. They will offer you that bit of protection from that radiant heat, and that's all. Don't consider this as a real option. It's a last resort. For your information, um, for those of you in, in the Kudji locality, your nearest bushfire place of last resort, should you want it, because we know you won't, would be the Panmure Public Hall grounds, approximately nine, 9.3 kilometers away, actually. So that's a nine kilometer drive that you would have to undertake to locate a bushfire place of last resort. A longer road that potentially could be a dangerous fire road. Is it worth the risk? I think not. I think the best option, I know the best option, will be to leave early and not even have to think about a place of last resort. Your first option will be to implement your fire plan and go to where you think will be safe for you, away from the fire, away with your family. For further information, there, there are a number of other bushfire places of last resort. Um, there's a further seven or eight located in Warrnambool. Further away, of course, but those options are available there as well for you. What so I'd like to do is... Sorry, if, um, if you do need to use any of those from Kudji, you would think that um, part of your plan would be to know in either Panmure or Allensford or Warrnambool where to go. Um, plan to be in someone else's, at someone, a friend's house rather than on mm. the oval in Warrnambool. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. That's a, that's a good point. Um, the, the, the locations in Warrnambool are a further 12 kilometres away. So there again, you're, you're creating, you're not actually helping yourself by making this extra level of stress to try and find these places at the last time. At the, as a last option, just doesn't make sense. And we've spoken about it a number of times now, limit your stress burden, stay in control of the situation and move away from the imminent fire danger. Use the fire danger rating, use your Vic emergency app, act early and leave early. I'd like to show you Almost our final slide now. And again, I thank you for your patience and the comments and also the poll responses. These few slides give you just a, a snippet of a vision of what fires, particularly fast moving grass fires are capable of doing. We have the embers and the ember attack and that intensity of radiant heat. We have the canopy fires along roadsides that burn we have the, the, the damage to our environment that's done with fast-moving grass fires and the scarred landscape that they leave. And, of course, the smoke, the, vis the visual fire, the smoke and the plumes that we often see. These are some of the main take-home messages, and these resources are now available to you. You're able to download a resource called Your Guide to Survival, a very succinct document that gives you the key points around survival and staying safe during five times. Your guide to property preparation, as mentioned by the Property Advice Visit Service, the PABS program. Again, another succinct document giving those key, key pointers. I've already mentioned the bushfire planning workshops that we are happy to assist with. The importance of the Vic Emergency app and connecting to your local brigade. These small communities like Kudji, where you know, we've got a small population, but a very intimate and tight-knit population, it's crucial that we are connected to our brigade. In this regard, our local brigade captain, Clayton, Clayton Young, is more than happy to entertain any request that you might have regarding brigade capacity, fire planning, even assisting with the brigade or giving further, further, further guidance, you know, we all have something to bring to the table. Let's keep that conversation going because it's the community connection that will help us stay safe during this fire period. Julie, if we'd like to launch the final poll. 
Yes, thank you, Raj. We will we'll launch the final poll. The final poll just helps us understand um, how we've gone with this presentation. So once again, there's no right or wrong answer and we don't know who's answering what. But did this meeting give you a better understanding of bushfire risk in your local area? Um, yes, no, or confirmed what I already know? Or would you recommend, and would you recommend this program to family, friends, or neighbours that live in your fire prone, in a fire prone area? Just a yes or no. So if you can just vote on each of those, like I said, it will just assist us in developing these programs and helping get that message across. So I'll end the polling and share the results. And thank you. Thank you very much for those results. Um, can mm. see, I'm pleased to see that people um, have found some benefit in this presentation. Oh, that, that's actually very reassuring for us. It's great to know that the information we give will actually inform you to stay safer during the fire period. And that's our job done. That's our, that's our main objective for these fire safety essentials is to give you the basics to stay safe. What I'd like to do now, and we at the CFA, we acknowledge that some of the imagery that we've shown you this afternoon can actually be quite disturbing, both emotionally and sometimes it can open up old, old hurt. There are a couple of services that are available to you and that you are welcome to access should you require any further support in this regard. On behalf of Julie and myself, we'd like to say thank you for your feedback, your presence this afternoon, and certainly some of the chat and the polling information. I'd like to thank Clayton for his assistance in putting this presentation together. I'd like to say, say, stay safe. And if there's anything further that we can do, please feel free to, con feel free to contact either one of us through Clayton, and we'd be happy to take any further questions. So, Julie? Thank you. Thank you, Raj, and thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. Your comments, um, and as Raj says, your poll answers are, are most um, welcome and appreciated. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you, everyone. We'll talk again soon. Bye Thank for now. You. Bye. Bye.